Tonight, the DEA's Facebook page impersonation. Twitter sues the U.S. government and the feds hacked Silk Road without a warrant. And they say that's okay. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 188 for Tuesday, October 7th, 2014. This episode is brought to you by Nature Box. Nature Box ships great tasting, healthy snacks right to your door. Forget the vending machine and start snacking smarter with healthy, delicious treats like Santa Fe corn sticks. To get your free Nature Box sampler, go to naturebox.com slash twit. That's naturebox.com slash twit. Hello, everyone. I'm Sarah Lane, and let's get right into the tech feed. Facebook has removed a profile created by a DEA agent that used a woman named Sandra Acriet's identity, which included her name, photos of herself, and even photos of her family that he found on her seized cell phone. The Justice Department is reviewing the incident, but initially claimed in a court filing that the federal agent had the right to impersonate this woman online by creating a Facebook page in her name without her knowledge in order to communicate with suspected criminals. Now, she first learned her identity had been used back in 2010 when a friend found this Facebook page, although she had never set it up herself. Law enforcement officers had previously arrested Arquette, alleging that she was part of a drug ring. A judge sentenced her to probation, but while she was awaiting trial, U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration Special Agent Timothy Sinigan created the fake Facebook page using her real name, posted photos from this seized cell phone, and communicated with at least one wanted fugitive. The Justice Department's top spokesman, Brian Fallon, tells BuzzFeed, quote, The incident at issue in this case is under review by Justice Department officials. Now, as far as Facebook goes, a spokesperson declined to comment on the case, though the site's community standards do say, quote, claiming to be another person, creating a false presence for an organization, or creating multiple accounts undermines community and violates Facebook terms. The spokesperson said there's no exception to this policy for law enforcement, although Facebook has since taken down the profile. You know, poor shell shock. It's the vulnerability that just gets blamed for everything. Yesterday, Yahoo told Security Week that servers associated with Yahoo Games had been hacked as a result of the recently disclosed shell shock vulnerability. But the company now says that's not actually what happened. It was a minor bug in a parsing script. Either way, Yahoo claims no evidence has been found suggesting that user information was affected by the incident. Yahoo Chief Information Security Officer Alex Stamos explained in a post on Hacker News, quote, As you can imagine, this episode caused some confusion in our team since the servers in question had been successfully patched twice immediately after the bash issue became public. He's talking about gel shock. Once we ensured that the impacted servers were isolated from the network, we conducted a comprehensive trace of the attack code through our entire stack, which revealed the root cause not shell shock. Let this be a lesson to defenders and attackers alike. Just because exploit code works doesn't mean it triggered the bug you expected. Today, Twitter sued the U.S. government, alleging that the Justice Department's restrictions on what the company can say publicly about the government's national security requests for user data violate the company's First Amendment rights. This is Kind of the next step for Twitter in reaching some sort of an agreement with the government on what level of disclosure is allowed about the scale of government surveillance. Currently, tech companies can report the number of requests they receive from the government in broad terms, such as 0 to 999 type thing. Twitter wants to be able to disclose the exact number of national security related orders it receives. For example, 875 or 10 or even 0. Twitter's complaint describes wanting to report data in a way that reflects the limited scope of the U.S. government surveillance of Twitter accounts because Twitter posts are, by and large, public. And unlike, say, an email provider, the company doesn't really receive a huge number of requests. Back in January, the government reached settlements on this basically the exact same issue with Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, LinkedIn, and Facebook, all who withdrew their legal challenges. But Twitter argued since it didn't receive the same scale of requests as those five companies, it shouldn't be subject to the same limits. Government lawyers refused to amend the agreement to accommodate Twitter. So in July, the company said in a blog post that it was preparing to sue, and it has. 
Back to a little bit more Facebook news, if you're ready. The New York Times reports that the company is working on a standalone mobile app that allows users to communicate without having to use their real names. The Times is citing anonymous sources. The app, which may be released in a matter of weeks, is a bit of a departure from Facebook's long-standing approach that a Facebook profile with a real name is the way to establish your identity and connect to others in your online and offline social graph. But the company has come around a bit on offering anonymity to users. Earlier this year, CEO Mark Zuckerberg said the company would allow developers to incorporate an anonymous log in feature to third-party apps. That would let users try out different apps without limiting what information that they handed over, while limiting it anyway. And the last and uh, following weeks of protest last week, finally Facebook said that it would allow members of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities to use not their actual given names, but names that they have chosen to identify themselves. So things are changing around Facebook. Now a story about Facebook that has nothing to do with technology, or very little anyway. Some shuttle drivers that drive Facebook employees to and from the company's headquarters in Silicon Valley are seeking representation by the Teamsters Union in order to get wage increases and more livable driving schedules. The union wrote to CEO Mark Zuckerberg last Thursday asking him to intervene on the driver's behalf by pressing Facebook shuttle bus contractors to agree to bargain with the union on behalf of about 40 drivers who take Facebook employees to and from work. Quote, while your employees earn extraordinary wages and are able to live and enjoy life in some of the most exclusive neighborhoods in the Bay Area, these drivers can't afford to support a family, send their children to school, or least of all, afford to even dream of buying a house anywhere near where they work, says the Teamsters official, Rome Eloise, in a letter. One company official speaking anonymously to the New York Times said Facebook had signed a contract with the bus company for a certain amount of money and that it was the bus company that set drivers' wages and schedules. Ars Technica reports today that Adobe's Digital Editions ebook and PDF reader is not safe. It's an app used by thousands of libraries to give people access to lending libraries electronically, basically e-libraries, actively logging and reporting every document that readers add to their local library, along with what they're doing with their files. Here's where it gets bad. The logs are transmitted over the internet in plain text, which is a no-no, unencrypted, allow anybody who can monitor network traffic, oh, like the NSA or an internet service provider, or a cable company, or even anybody sharing a public Wi-Fi network to read those logs. The exposure of data was first discovered by Nate Hoffelder of the Digital Reader. He says he reported the issue to Adobe, but never received a reply. This afternoon, an Adobe spokesperson told ours the company is working on an update. Gotta be loud if you want anything done around here. Coming up, the first, the first Facebook killer was supposed to be Ello, right? Remember that? Now, which social network will rise to be the Ello killer? The answer may surprise you. And up next, I'll chat with Andy Greenberg from Wired about how the FBI hacked Silk Road, but didn't need a warrant to do so. But first, let's thank NatureBox for sponsoring this episode of TN2. Right now, NatureBox is giving you a chance to get a free trial box of their most popular snack. So, I want you to just... Get away from the coffee cake. That's, there's actually some in our break room right now. I don't know who brought it. I don't need the potato chips. Those aren't good for you. You want delicious, wholesome snacks from naturebox.com because you want it to taste good, but you can't be eating junk all day. That's not the sustenance you need. Naturebox has hundreds of delicious snacks that don't make you feel guilty because they're better for you. Zero artificial flavors, zero colors, zero sweeteners, zero grams of trans fat, no high fructose corn syrup. You'd think I'd be good at saying that by now. You'll even find snacks with no added sugar, no gluten. So when you get hungry and you're having a dip and you wonder how are you going to get a little bit of cal caloric intake, you grab some honey macadamia pretzel pops from Nature Box or maybe some garlic plantains or some cranberry macaroon granola. All delicious. They're really good and they're better for you than those snack options out there. Start your free trial today and you'll get a free sampler box at naturebox.com slash twit. You want to stay full? You want to stay strong? You're working in technology, darn it. Or maybe you're just watching shows about technology, but you want to snack smarter. Go to naturebox.com slash twit. And thanks to Naturebox for their support of Tech News Tonight. Joining us now is Andy Greenberg, senior writer at Wired and author of the book, This Machine Kills Secrets. Hey, Andy. Hey, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being here. So, all right. So this is a kind of an interesting story. We're about 
what, a month out from a scheduled trial of Ross Ulbricht, who is right. allegedly the creator of Silk Road, which is a, sort of a black market drug site. Yeah. Now, his it's defense insane. lawyers... And bizarre. Yeah, exactly. His defense lawyers are now saying that the government illegally hacked the site to figure out a location of a hidden server and ultimately track him down. So how did this happen? Well, uh, no, we don't really know the facts of what happened yet. The prosecution in the case has been very careful. Actually, uh, just to be clear, they, they're saying they, they're not admitting that the FBI hacked the Silk Road. They in, instead say that the FBI kind of was just poking around on the Silk Road's login page when, surprise, it, it just accidentally leaked its IP address, despite the fact that it was running this anonymity software, Tor, which was meant to hide its location. So uh, since then, the, the security community and the defense have poked holes in this story and basically come up with a, a big list of inconsistencies in, in that FBI account of how the Silk Road was found. And today, or, or rather last night, the prosecution responded by saying, listen, guys, actually, you know, we're not saying that the FBI hacked the Silk Road, but even if they did, even if they did actually, uh, you know, remotely intrude on the server without a warrant, that would still be legal. So, uh, you know, forget about this question of whether they hacked the server or not, because even if they did it, that's that's still not a violation of Ross Ulbricht's Fourth Amendment pr privacy rights. How how are they able to claim this? I mean, isn't the search warrant a search warrant for, for this exact reason? Well, they point to a few kind of loopholes in the Fourth Amendment or what they would say are loopholes. So the first is that the Silk Road server wasn't in the United States. It was in a data center in Iceland. Uh, you know, we don't know why. Uh, Ross Ulbricht put it there if, that, if he did, in fact. Um, it, it could be that he thought that it would be less, it would be immune in a way from uh, discovery by American law enforcement. In fact, it, it may have worked against him. He also didn't own that computer. He was renting it from a web hosting service. So it kind of falls again to this sort of third party problem where the FBI doesn't have a duty to protect the privacy of Ross Ulbricht so much as the service that actually owns this computer. And since he, he, you know, is accused of violating the terms of service by selling about a billion dollars worth of drugs with that computer, uh, the company that was hosting the computer doesn't have any, any obligation to protect his privacy. So a couple of little loopholes like this are what the prosecution is pointing to to say, listen, basically, um, we don't, we didn't need a warrant. Uh, this was essentially, you know, a, a completely legal search. You mentioned Tor and that the server was supposed to be hidden uh, within the Tor network. If that's the case, how did anybody find it? Well, that's the big question here. So the, the FBI says that Tor was simply misconfigured on the Silk Road homepage. Mm. Maybe you know, they, they kind of vaguely say, well, our agents, he uh, entered some miscellaneous characters into the entry fields on the site, including the CAPTCHA and... Uh, just discovered that lo and behold, there was the IP address. But you know, when security folks in the you know in, in the kind of hacker community analyze this story, it sounds they, pretty far fetched, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly, it all sounds pretty fishy, and it it could be a kind of um, way of glossing over the the true story, which is that they did some sort of SQL injection, which also basically involves entering miscellaneous characters into that entry field. You know, they, they could have fuzzed it, which is sort of entering random characters until you find a way to crash the site. And then once you found that crash, you keep, you know, tweaking what your the characters that you're entering until you trick the site into spitting out some of the data that you're looking for, in this case, the IP address. So, so that's like a, you know, that that does sort of technically fall within the, the way that the FBI has described this, but it's, it would very cleverly, I think, prevents a judge from from understanding this to be hacking, it would sound more like a kind of legal search. So if the case is moved from kind of a, a case about illegal activities into more of a civil liberties case, and you've got security experts saying, this all sounds fishy, but maybe can't prove uh, what they uh, think is, is probably a fishy situation, how do you see this case playing out? Well... The prosecution is doing everything it can to prevent this from becoming a civil liberties case. And that this is really the issue, is that uh, Russell Burke's defense would like to make this a story about privacy 
and civil liberties and not a story about crypto anarchy and massive amounts of cybercrime and narcotics conspiracy. So uh, this is why we're having this discussion before the trial even starts. If the defense can successfully you know, go forward with this motion and, and show that that the server was found through illegal means, then it may be that they can convince the court to throw out essentially the rest of the investigation, all the other evidence that the FBI dug up. It, you know, if, if in fact that all resulted from this sort of tainted first step of illegally hacking the site. Are we still looking at a trial next month, given all of this new information that that that, that people are parsing? Well, you know, uh, it, is, it does seem like there's still room for a settlement. You know, if if the defense lucked out and the judge agreed with them that this, that, you know, that all of this uh, evidence had to be thrown out, that could really change the prosecution's uh, strategy altogether. They could you know, have to reduce the charges to, you know, who knows what, nothing. On the other hand, if the defense's motion is completely overruled, then it may be that Ross Ulbricht's looking at these massive charges, which include a kingpin charge of, you know, usually, usually that's reserved for someone who's running a mafia organization or a drug cartel. Uh, he faces potentially decades in prison, and it's very conceivable that he would settle too before this trial comes around. Andy Greenberg is a senior writer over at Wired, also the author of the book, This Machine Kills Secrets. Thanks so much for joining us, Andy, and giving us a little bit more information on the Silk Road story that just will never end, apparently. Uh, tell folks know, uh, let folks know where they can keep up with your work. Well, you know, it's probably best to just Google my name and Wired. So that's Andy Greenberg and Wired. There you Thanks go. Well, that's a good, a good answer. Yeah, yeah, Google it. Why don't you? Thanks so much, Andy. Thanks. All right. So we, we mentioned Ello. Remember Ello? E L L O dot co. It was supposed to be this like really cool new social network and it was the new Facebook and everybody wanted to sign up. And there were actually quite a few signups over the last week. You know, some woman who lives in San Francisco took Sarah Lane. I mean, that never happens. Well, Ello hasn't actually gone anywhere, but the fanfare has definitely died down. A lot of usernames were secured, and then everybody got bored and moved back to Facebook, right? So I'm not really a Facebook killer. What will kill Facebook, though? Some, somebody's got to. Maybe it's a social network called Audi, O-W-D-Y, that lets you friend yourself. Yes, the Audi manifesto reads, quote, We believe that you care more about defining your friends than reading what they have to share. We believe that statuses, likes, and comments only get in the way of the superficial display of self-importance. We believe you'll request an invite just to secure your username in case we end up being the next big thing. We believe your friends will have accounts before you and it will drive you insane. We believe a social network can be a tool for selling our startup at a tidy profit empowerment. Not a tool to deceive, coerce, and manipulate, but a place to claim your username and redefine your friends. Okay, so if you haven't figured out, this is a parody social network. This is a joke. It's not real. Well, it actually kind of is real, but obviously the premise is a joke. But Audi kind of does have a point about social network profile username land grabs. What is that all about anyway? Is it about actual friendships? No, increasingly not. I don't know. Let, 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 let me know if you sign up and if you're having fun over on Audi. And that is it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. I'm not going to bother. That other Sarah Lane can go to town. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. You can write us with feedback, questions, or comments at TN2 at twit.tv. And don't miss our morning news program. It's almost as good as this one. Tech News Today, tomorrow, and every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I am Sarah Lane, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by CashFly.com.